Hello everyone, happy Wednesday. Today I'm going to be joined by Julia Pennington. Julia is the founder of Dignify, which is a trauma consultancy based up in Manchester. Um, and so we're going to have a discussion around what trauma is and the different ways that Julia helps her clients um, recover from trauma. So I can see that Julia is live, so I'm going to ask her to come and join us. Just take a minute. Hello. Hello. Hi, Julia. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. I keep having this weird thing with Instagram, like, where, like the screen goes black. I don't know why. No, I can see you fine. Good, good. <laughs> and how is everything up in Manchester? It's a bit rainy today. Um, I'm just sat in an office in between appointments to do this call, so yeah, but it's, it's all right. It's a bit rainy today. We had a nice day yesterday. Well, yeah, I think all of us are having this really random May where it's just raining the whole time through. None of this lovely late spring weather for us. Yeah, Manchester's known for the rain, so it's nothing new for us. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me first of all um let's kind of get into it are you mm -hmm. happy to share a bit about your background and how you came to work with trauma in particular yeah of course so i think for me it started probably about 18 years ago i started my career in the criminal justice system and i worked for probation youth offending teams um and during that 18 years, I think every client I worked with, I was hearing all these kind of horror stories of, of trauma and bad experiences that they'd had as, had as children. And for me, it was no surprise that a lot of these people had ended up involved in the criminal justice system because they hadn't been taught right from wrong. They'd been in the care system. They'd had experiences when they were children that had been violent or traumatizing. And I never really knew what to do about it because the criminal justice system, that's not your job. Your job is to protect the public. It's to make sure that someone sticks to a court order. And so I was kind of in this parallel world where I felt like, well, I'm going to do my job because that's what I'm employed to do. But actually there's something else that needs to happen here. Where does this recovery work take place with people? And so I quit my job in kind of public sector services in about 2013, I think it was, 2011 it was. And I was lucky enough to get a job in a charity. And the, the charity had been given quite a lot of money by the government to work out why so many young people go back to jail within a year of being released. And the statistic at that time was 78% of young people under the age of 25 being released from custody would go straight back within a year. And the government wanted to know why. So we sat with 150 boys and we asked them all the same question. Why do you keep going back to jail? What's been your experience? And it was trauma. There was 150 different stories but ultimately what they were all describing was trauma. So I went off down to Glastonbury and worked with um, some trauma healers down there who um, did a course on how to um, work with people on trauma. And I'd done a lot of kind of self-development work myself anyway. And I'd always been interested in trauma because of my own early life experiences as well and kind of didn't really feel too different to my clients in terms of our stories. They were quite similar. Um, and so after the 12 month course in Glastonbury, I decided I was going to use all my criminal justice knowledge, all my trauma knowledge, all my knowledge of engaging people and create the Dignify model, um, which is what I did. And we're now working in probation across Manchester, supporting people to recover from traumatic experiences. We're also starting to train professionals as well um, to understand what trauma is. And that, that works with uh, professionals that work with young people and also with adults. Mm. So. And that leads me to, you know, really important question around what is trauma? Because it's such a big word, I think, for a lot of people. And yeah. from my perspective, I think it's really, it's, it's, it's personal and, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's objective. Because I think yeah. you can believe, well, trauma is something really, really big that yeah. happened. Um, but it can also be something really small that's had a huge impact or that appears to be small that's had a huge impact on you. 
So what's yeah. your definition of trauma? So for me, trauma is something that affects you. It affects your perception of the world. It's anything that makes you feel horror, helpless, or, you know, like you're unsafe and out of control. And um, anything that makes you or your family feel threatened or at risk, um, can all, all those kind of, um, what's the word, define a traumatic experience. But I think the thing with trauma is it's degree versus impact. Because as you said, there's different degrees of trauma and people will also react or not react in different ways, depending on their own resilience and their own ability to manage stress and problems as it hits them. So I think, you know, it's degree versus impact. There's different degrees of trauma, but it's also about the impact that has on another person. You know, I could, it's, you and I could be walking down the street and both observe something that was quite traumatic, whether it be someone being run over or, and both of us might be affected in different ways by that experience based on our own resilience and our experiences prior to that day. Um, so trauma, it, it, it can be anything such as seeing a bomb go off, which we see, we see all over the world, don't we, every day. But it can be something as small as being told every day that you're worthless and you're never going to amount to anything as a child. You know, and, and a lot of the people I'm working with, their trauma started in childhood. And what we do with children in the first seven years of their life or the first 18 years of their life is, is very important. Um, and that's where, if you think about it, the brain, the brain is growing, it's developing, it's forming, the neurons are all sort of wiring together. If we're, if children are exposed to traumatic experiences in their early years, then they're not going to be able to regulate their emotions, they're not going to be able to feel safe, they're not going to be able to feel connected with caregivers, because especially if it's caregivers causing that abuse or causing that fear. Mm -hmm. So it's a really complex topic, um, and I could be here all day explaining what it is, but ultimately it's about the impact of that person rather than the experience itself yeah and so with that in mind if it's all down to the personal impact is it reasonable to say that all of us have experienced trauma at some stage in our lives that was my personal view i think if you could introduce me to somebody who has never experienced a trauma i'd be interested to meet them um but in my experience i think we've all at some level experience some sort of trauma whether it be witnessing something or seeing something that scares us you know um i always use the example of video games when we're letting children play really violent video games we're desensitizing them while the brains are growing and so what would be horrendous and violent to us children are normalizing from a really young age because of the things that they're exposed to mm. so. and i know that your your work is based in a non-clinical approach and i'm guessing that that's informed by the work that you the training that you did in glastonbury uh, what what does that mean and what what are you what's your methodology well actually it's not because the work i did in glastonbury was with therapists they were actually qualified trauma therapists what i have understood from working in the criminal justice system for the last 18 years is there's a real stigma attached to mental health services Nobody wants a label of having a mental health issue. And a lot of people are fearful about speaking up about the mental health and trauma. Ultimately, that's what it affects your mental health. And so um, for me, it's about how we can support people to remove that stigma and to say, actually, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You don't need fixing. You've just had experiences that you struggle to cope with. And that's where my model becomes non-clinical. And that's not to say that some of the people that I work with might not access clinical services. They do. But my model is about actually let's open up that conversation. Let's talk about what you've been through in a non-threatening way where you're not going to be labelled or diagnosed or any of those things. We're just talking about how hurt you feel. And that's why I call it a non-clinical approach. I'm not here to add to the labels and, and all the other things that doctors do. That's their job. It's not mine. Mm. So what, what does the work that you do look like? If I were one of your clients, um, what would happen? Yeah, so we start off very much by do, delivering some awareness sessions. Do you know what trauma is? Do you know how trauma affects your brain? Do you know what it does to your body and, and the way you feel? Because I think we all think trauma is something that happens to us that we then have to think about and process, but actually it's a feeling. We're left with physical pain, physical feelings, and what a lot of people do is they'll use substances, drink, alcohol, workaholics, you know, any aholics, you know, what we're trying to do is escape from ourselves and numb that kind of pain that we feel from traumas. Um, and so the work that I do is, is first of all about making people aware of what trauma is and how it affects you. 
And then once we've done that, it's about, okay, now we know what it is and how it affects you. How can we support you to move on from it? And it's not a case of me doing that work. I don't do anything. I give people the tools to do that work themselves. I think, especially in the criminal justice system, there's a lot of people feeling done to. Oh, what are you going to do to me now when I tell you this? And I don't want to be another agency or service that does to people. My role is about giving people the, empowering people to take ownership of their own lives, of their own experiences and do something about it and giving them the tools and the strategies to do that rather than me saying, oh, I'm going to be your rescuer and I'm going to heal you. I'm not a healer and I'm not a rescuer. It's about them having the skills and the strategies to do it for themselves. And that's what empowers us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I completely believe that there's opportunities for us to empower children. You know, it's not just adults that can be empowered around this really important stuff. It's children too. And so for parents or teachers or caregivers who are really looking to support children in their lives that might have experienced a level of trauma, you know, what kind of advice or guidance or signposting might you give to them? <sighs> Oh, my big one at the moment is get away from punitive approaches. Um, punishing people doesn't work. Um, and punishing children doesn't work. You know, you're working with that kind of fear part of the brain, which is going to be triggered because of previous traumas. If you're constantly trying to punish children for bad behavior, what you're going to do is you're going to embed those messages that I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me, I'm naughty, you know, I would not be taking your children down that path at all. Instead, what I'd be doing is supporting your children to understand the behavior, to understand what's just happened, and to explore well, what feelings are you having and where do those feelings come from and you know if a child's misbehaving in school is it because they're feeling inadequate is it because the work's too hard there's always a reason why somebody's behaving in that way and if we look at developmental trauma you know two children start in school there's a really interesting image that I can share with you for you to share with your followers. And it shows a brain scan of two children starting school. One of them has experienced trauma, one hasn't. And what it shows you is that the brain growth is affected by trauma. The brain development is affected by trauma. So a child who's experienced, it could even be birth trauma or trauma that mum's experienced when she's pregnant. This isn't about blaming parents, but it's about supporting them to understand where some of this stuff is coming from. Because as a parent myself, when your child's misbehaving, you're like, God, what done wrong where did I go wrong as a parent you know and actually sometimes it's not about what you've done wrong it's about how that child's functioning because of feelings that they're carrying and so I think my model is all about getting away from punishment and, and moving more into a place of awareness making people aware of the behavior oh are you aware you do this and why do you think you do that where do you think that comes from and how does that make you feel because what we're doing when we do we're doing that is we're encouraging children to develop emotional intelligence rather than teaching them to block their emotions and say, look, we don't talk about emotions. And if you talk about your emotions, you're going to be in trouble. It's that punitive approach, isn't it? Whereas actually, if we're creating a safe space for children to talk about the feelings, and that's the biggest part of recovery for me. Mm. I mean, as you say, there's no blame for parents at all. You know, in the main, we're all just trying to do our best. And, there's and we're all traumatized at some level. So we're doing our best based on our traumas. Yeah, because we, you know, culturally and generationally, we're often brought up in a situation where we were told to, you know, don't cry or, you know, go, go to Big your boys don't cry. You know, yeah. are you brave? Let's be brave. All these things that we're teaching our kids, we're saying, hold your emotions in. Yeah. You know, um, and what is that, what that's causing in adulthood is very angry adults who are exploding with emotion, who are struggling to manage the mental health issues. We've got to create spaces where people feel safe to talk about the feelings. Mm. And what do you think, I mean, it's a bit, it's big. It's a really big problem. It what is. do you think, what are some of the things, you know, I know we talked about talking about our feelings and creating safe spaces, but are there, are there other things that feel tangible and accessible? for individuals to be doing because otherwise it can it can feel so overwhelming um, yeah you know, everyone's tired and stressed and you know coming or with living through a pandemic you know, there's a lot yeah. um and so is kind of one of your messages around giving ourselves a break as adults definitely i mean the bit, first thing i teach my clients is self-care you know, because we don't care for ourselves. Like I said, we're workaholics, we're shopaholics. The amount of people that rushed out, oh, the shops are open quick, I can go and feed my habit of shopping, you know. The amount of us that rushed out to do that, we're all constantly looking for some sort of fulfillment. And for me, it's 
you're looking for fulfillment in the wrong places. You know, what nurtures your soul? What makes you soothe yourself? Because trauma affects your nerves. It affects your nervous system. It puts us on high alert. It makes us sort of hypervigilant or hyper, hyper aroused, looking for danger all the time. And actually, the way to recover from trauma is to really start to settle your nerves down. How do we calm that nervous system down? How do we slow everything down a little bit, you know? hot bath a cup of tea and just even just being mindful for a few moments rather than we have sixty six thousand thoughts in a day minimum you think of what your brain's like a train station how can you just pepper your day with little strategies that will make you stop and be mindful for a few moments and and you know you think about it parents trying to raise families work hold a job down we're in a pandemic you know working from home all these stresses that we have actually it's not about saying to parents, well, you've done that wrong, then you didn't do that right. You were just doing your best. We're all just doing our best, aren't we? None of us deliberately want to traumatise our children or hurt them. But actually, sometimes just by not being mindful and by being in that busyness of life, that can happen. And it's about how we can just slow down a little bit and just start to be a bit more considered before we do things. There's a lot of conversation around self-care at the minute. And again, I think that can be open to interpretation as to what it means. And so what I'm hearing from you, it doesn't mean you have to be able to go and have an expensive massage or you know, do all of these things that are ex external to us, but just finding just five minutes even of some, some quiet time. Um, just well, this is the thing. A lot of the people I'm working with, you know, they don't have the finances for massage or reflexology or any of the lovely things that we like to do to care for ourselves. We have to keep it basic. Have you had a hot bath? Just how about you go and sit down for a minute and can you tell me how your feet feel on the floor? Are you grounded? Are you in your body? You know, it's just bringing that awareness back to self rather than out there. What's going on in here? Yeah. Yeah. So getting yeah. really curious and patient and kind to yourself and kind to ourselves yeah because if you think about it if we've had all these traumatic experiences they're rolling around inside us every single day and what do you do to kind of calm that down what do you do to keep a lid on that you can't wait a week for a massage when you wake up triggered or you hear a song on the radio that reminds you of somebody who passed away or somebody that you really cared about is no longer in your life or whatever we're triggered by our previous traumas constantly it might be a smell God, the smell of cigarettes does it for some people if they've had a negative experience around that. Smell of alcohol. We're triggered by our five senses. We can't predict when that's going to happen. But when it does happen, what do we do to care for ourselves? Yeah. One of the things that you and I have spoken about in the past, and I wanted to talk about a bit today, is ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. Because again, I'm seeing this is being talked about a lot more or... But what does, what does it mean? What, what are adverse childhood experiences? How long have we got? <laughs> so the ACE study was a huge Californian study. Um, I think in the end, they ended up interviewing 17,000 people. And the interviews started about health issues. They wanted to talk to people and say, right, you've got obesity and you've got diabetes or all these different health issues. Let's talk about your health issues. But actually what doctors found and researchers found is when they sat down to talk to people about their health issues, all of them started talking about the childhood traumas. So, you know, when did your overeating start? Oh, well, it was when I was six when this happened. You know, well, when did you first get ill? Oh, probably when I was about eight when this happened. And so doctors noticed a pattern, hence why they ended up interviewing 17,000 people. And it became the biggest study ever. It, it ran from, I think, the late 70s or into the 80s. And these days, it's starting to come more into modern day society, I think. I think before the ACE study, we, we associated trauma as being something that happened to veterans, people who'd, you know, coming from war. And if you look at the history of it, if we look at World War One, we talked about soldiers coming back shell shocked, you know. So the history of trauma had always been there and we knew what PTSD was for the kind of people returning from war, but we hadn't associated PTSD with the general population until the ACE study. And what the ACE study did was it broke it broke down what people had told them into ten questions. And there's so there's ten questions of experiences that we all may or may not have had in the, in the family home and it might be you know was you often or very often called names at home was you often or very often exposed to violence at home and so the ACE study what it did was it created a, a an assessment I want to say and it is an assessment where we can tick off how many traumas we've had 
And then what they did was they measured ACEs. So anybody who has four or more ACEs in the ACE, in the ACE test, uh, your, like, your likelihood of offending goes up, your likelihood of exclusion from school goes up. I think if you've got four, they did a study in 2015 on, uh, I think it was 508 year olds. And um, those who had four or more ACEs were 32%, more, 32 times more likely to have behavioral problems. So um, ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And what the ACE test does is it allows you to kind of look at those adverse childhood experiences and, and which ones you or your clients have experienced. And then you can look at the odds of them then going on to be um, excluded from school, involvement in the system, and the pattern starts and on it continues. So how can we, because again, this sounds like, you know, it's another label and it can sound quite negative in some ways. It's kind of check boxes. This happened, as this happened, this happened. How can we use this information in a positive way? How do you use it positively in your work? Well, I think for me, a lot of the work that I do, and this is a bit of my own story as well. It's about our narrative, isn't it? We can either look at our experiences through the eyes of a victim and, oh my God, you know, all these terrible things have happened to me and I'm a victim of this. Or actually, oh my God, all these terrible things have happened to me that made me really strong. And what am I going to do with these things that happened to me? How am I going to use it to benefit the world or to create change or to do something with my life? And that's the way I work with clients. We all hold a sort of internal narrative about ourselves and about the world as well. And generally what I find is that narrative is really hard. One of the first sessions I do with people is, right, I am. They're the two most important words in, in the world because what follows them creates your destiny. So I want 20 positive sentences that start with I am. Usually my clients can't give me two. And that shows you instantly their perception of self and how they see themselves. So if somebody feels worthless and don't feel like they can achieve any, how are we ever going to get them into work or get them to be functioning parts of society? We're not. You've got to start with how they see themselves and how they feel about themselves. And usually that's shaped by traumatic experiences. I mean, the I am exercise sounds to me like something that's like a really nice practice, right? That you could do with your kids as they're growing up. I mean, yeah. we have this little board up for my two year old, just like, you know, saying she is happy, strong, um, mm -hmm. clever. Like, is that, and even as adults, it feels like a good positive reinforcement thing that we could do to focus on yeah. all of the positive things rather than yeah. negative. And if you think about a lot of us have quite a negative narrative internally, even if you think, oh, God, what have I done? I'm so stupid. We, we do it, don't we? We're always telling ourselves off. But when do we ever say, well, don't you? You're wonderful. That was great what you've just done. But how often do we do that? We don't. It's not in our psyche to do that. We're always so hard on ourselves. And again, stems from trauma, from others being hard on us. If you look at the education system, certainly when I was growing up, the education system was, oh, you get your work done. It was all punitive and it was harsh if you didn't do it right. And so we've developed that harshness in the way that we talk to ourselves. And, and that's something that I think as a society we need to address. I think it's probably one of the under, underlying problems with the levels of suicide we've got as well. Yeah. I mean, what's your sense of the mental health statistics for children and young people are getting worse? We yeah. know that. In 2017, it was like one in eight, five to 16 year olds was being diagnosed with a mental health disorder. It's now one in six. What's your level of, um, I mean, do you have a level of optimism that we can turn this around for the better? And well, what, what should we be doing? What should government be doing? And what can we be doing on, on a, you know, a family, local community level about this? I mean, I think there's a famous quote, isn't there? I think it was it Gandhi who said, if you want to change the world, change yourself. Yeah. And I think that's what I would encourage everybody to do. This starts with you. How are you functioning? How are you interacting with the world? How do you treat the people that you love and care about? You know, do you speak kindly about yourself? Do you speak kindly about others? Because one of the biggest things that I have to do is I have to walk my talk. You know, I'm working with people who are really damaged and I can't one minute be being all compassionate and then the next minute be sort of saying, yeah. you know, I've got to warm my talk. And it's about how all of us every day can just be nice human beings and be kind. You know, underneath all of the work that I do is compassion. We've got to be compassionate with ourselves and each other. And there's a, I think Gabor Mate, he's a trauma specialist who works on addiction. Well, he talks about compassionate inquiry and that's where I, I'm, 
I mentioned earlier about getting away from this punitive approach and that's compassionate inquiry. Well, why are you doing that? You know, what, what do you think is going on for you? It's about getting people to question what they're doing, but not from a place of judgment and you're bad and you're wrong, but from a place of, you know, understanding and, and care and wanting better. Um, ultimately, it's your approach, isn't it? You know, a bad approach follows a good argument, as they say. <laughs> it's making me think of um, like compassionate curiosity, not being yeah. afraid to ask questions and you yeah. know, being, being explorers in all of this stuff within ourselves as adults and grown ups, and also with the children in our lives. Well, children live in wonder anyway, don't they? I wonder why the tree is green. I wonder why the sky is blue. I wonder why that flies. It's so easy to get this in with children because they're already wondering stuff. So, you know, I wonder why you do that. Oh, I wonder why that... And, and so it's really easy with children. What's harder is when you've got a really angry adult with all this stuff embedded into them who doesn't even remember where it started or some of those traumas are, are so deeply buried and hidden somewhere in the psyche that they don't know why. I, feel, I don't know why I feel crap. I don't remember what happened. Yeah. That's much harder to unpick. If we can get in young and start teaching children to do this, it's a skill we'll take with them all lives. Yeah. I mean, I was speaking to a dad just this week who was saying his son has just turned that age of why, 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 why? And so maybe there's an opportunity when we are talking about feelings or stuff that's happened to mirror it back to them. Yeah. What, as you said, why do you think? Or Yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah, that place of wonder. I say it all the time. I wonder why. I wonder why this is happening. Even when it's something bad, I wonder why this is happening. You know, so we're not always labelling things as good and bad as well. You know, they just are what they are sometimes. So, Julia, if people who are watching this want to, to work with you, what kind of, do you, you work with families or organisations? Do we have to be in Manchester? No, we, we actually have a bit of a national footprint and we're growing quite rapidly, I have to say. Um, anybody who wants to work with us, get in touch with us. We work bespoke with organisations. We have, we're part of the National Restraint Reduction Network, so we do a lot of work around schools, young people, education, kind of getting people to think about behaviour management in a different way. So we've got that whole aspect of work. And then we've got our criminal justice arm, which is because the school's arm is about the prevention side. Let's stop these young people ending up in prisons and in the justice system. And then the justice side is about that recovery work. Um, a lot of the stuff we're doing actually because of COVID is online. So we're delivering a lot of our training online. Um, we're doing bits face to face with clients, but we're even working with clients um, over the phone and through virtual methods. And that surprised me because I thought, will it work virtually? But it actually is. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different ways um, that we can work with organizations. We do work bespoke as well. If an organization's got a particular issue, we'll come in and address that issue. We're doing some work at the moment with an organization on Bain stuff. So black and minority ethnic experiences of trauma. So, you know, people will come to us with different issues and, and we'll support them to develop a model. There's, there's three bits to what we do. We consult with organizations to help them to adapt practice and change practice and have policies and procedures that are kind of trauma responsive. Um, we have a training, uh, training program that we deliver to professionals and then we also have a, a recovery program that we deliver to clients or we can train organisations in our recovery program so they can deliver it to clients. And there's, there's four modules, just to close, there's four modules to our recovery program and it, um, it's reveal because first we've got to reveal what we've been through. Then it's feel, because we've got to feel the impact of that. Then it's heal, because we've got to get over it and, and get to a better place. And then it's zeal, because actually what trauma does is it takes that kind of happiness and that energy and that zest for life out of us. And we want to give people that back. So reveal, feel, heal, zeal. That's the one. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are elements of recovery. Well, I will... Yeah. Um, put your website in the notes with this film. Um, Brilliant. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to share, Julia? No, just to say like, you know, if anybody is struggling, um, then drop me a message, get in touch, you know, you're not on your own and, and it can be hard. And, you know, we've just come through what the last 18 months of a really difficult time. Uh, so just be gentle on yourself and find ways to sprinkle happiness into your day. Thank you, my lovely. I think you're an absolute angel. I really appreciate you taking the time today. And I will speak to you soon. Lots of love. See you Lots soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.